I grew up in a house where um, General Smuts was adored. And then I met General Smuts here when I was about seven or eight years old. And I always admired him. But, um, you know, I grew up in the time of the nationalist um, government and so on, and I was at an Afrikaans school, but an English church, and it was a bit difficult, I must be honest. I was forever involved in arguments and so on. But as I grew, I never learned about smuts at school. History, not at university either. Well, I only did first year history at university. And coming here, it, um, it, it sort of just increased my um, admiration for this man. And I learned so much more of him that I never even knew that anybody could be so learned and so literate and so uh, versatile. Uh, that is just how I um, got to know him here in the house. Um, you pick up so many more things just to be around here and to take a book off the shelf and to read it and to suddenly see, oh my goodness, can this be true? And it is true. The library was his sanctuary, so a visitor didn't just walk in here, and that also uh, applied to his children and to his grandchildren. And he loved his grandchildren. He loved children. And he would invite them in and say, take any book off the shelf, open it on any page and read me the first three lines and he would give them the title of the book. He was referred to as Slim Yoni, Clever Yoni. Now, he was actually uh, way, way ahead of his uh, contemporaries in his studies, in his, um, what he read. If you look around in this library, you will be astonished at the, the collection of books, number one. Number two is the titles, the subjects which he covered, and he had read it all. It, it wasn't just um, plain legal works that he was referring to. It was the sciences, biographies, international affairs, histories, the religious works. It, you know, he had a, a, a viewpoint on religion. He was a Christian, very, very staunch Christian, but he was open to other religions as well. He was um, a strategist. He was uh, trained as a strategist by uh, General De La Rey. That is one of the things. And his uh, strategy actually grew. It wasn't just restricted to the Anglo-Boer War, where he was on horseback. The First World War, he was in East Africa there, and then he um, uh, was a member of the War Cabinet at that time. And that is when the uh, aeroplanes was brought in. And he actually was the brains behind the Royal Air Force. And then here in South Africa, the South African Air Force, he was seen as a traitor to the Afrikaner course. As a matter of fact, when he went back to his commander in O'Keep after the signing of the uh, Peace of the Anaheim Treaty, when he announced that um, peace had resigned, one of the members of his commander uh, called out Yanni Smuts, you betrayed us. And right through his life, he was seen as a traitor to the Afrikaner cause, which in fact wasn't that. He never betrayed the Afrikaner cause. If you look at uh, what he actually did, number one was uh, four years after the um, assigning of the Peace of the Anaheim Treaty, he went to England when there was a change in government and he spoke to the new prime minister, the, uh, Sir Henry Campbell Bannamer, and he managed to persuade Sir Henry Campbell Bannamer that the two colonies in South Africa should uh, receive a representative government, which was granted in, uh, for the uh, Transvaal colony in de um, December 1906 for the uh, Orange River colony in June 1907. You know, he left a number of legacies, but I think the greatest one is that he placed South Africa on the world map. 
South Africa wasn't really considered at all. It was uh, just one of those British colonies uh, at that time. But South Africa was placed on the world map by him. If you look at the, um, the way he was accepted in overseas, not just in Britain, in the United States, in Holland, in the Netherlands, I should say, in Belgium, in Greece. South Africa wasn't just a little uh, colony. Uh, it was a country on the world map. Mm -hmm. 